This is the Truth Frequency Radio Network. We are TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you for another week of eye-gouging, crotch-kicking, no-holds-barred political discussion right here on TruthFrequencyRadio.com, 90.7 FM in Denver, 97.3 FM in Eugene, Oregon. Great to be back with you once again on this beautiful Tuesday afternoon, wherever you are across this great nation or around the world listening to us on the internet. Great to be with you once again. And, you know, I I, uh, I try not to be terribly naive. I try to approach politics, or, well, just life in general, with a healthy degree of cynicism. I very rarely get caught up in uh, these rainbow and unicorns ideas of oh well things will will get better you know and 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 uh, oh the, the 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 good times are just around the corner now that doesn't mean that I don't think things can get better or that we can't have good times around the corner in this country but I don't think you get those those type of results simply by wishing or by by saying it into being it's ludicrous. There are things that you can do to, to, to move forward towards that. But to just sit there at any given time and say, oh, well, it's all going to be better, I find that a little ridiculous. Now, I know there's other people out there that uh, that kind of need that type of affirmation in their life in, in order to get by from day to day, and I'm not criticizing them, but that's just not, that's just not my personality. I'm generally not a half a glass half full kind of guy. I'm generally more of a glass half empty sort of guy. So when I look at about anything in life, when I look at a, a political situation or a world event, I'm generally looking at it from the perspective of what's the worst that could possibly happen and prepare for that. And I usually don't get caught up in the ideas of the positives that could happen. Usually. And I think by taking that approach, as I've taken it since, really, I, I was a young man. I think that uh, I'm better prepared, in a lot of cases, to deal with the world as it is than, than some others might be. Everybody's got their different personality. Everybody approaches things differently, of course, but that's how I choose to approach it. And so, as a result, I, I think that in most cases, I keep myself from being too naive. I keep myself from, from falling into the trap of of really believing something's going to get better uh, without any basis for that belief. Or that a problem's going to get resolved or an issue's going to be taken care of or anything like that. I have a healthy cynicism, and, and, and I'm somewhat proud of that. But once in a while, I, I guess I'll slip a little bit. Once in a while, once in a while, I'll be a little too optimistic. Once in a while, I'll look at a situation and I'll say to myself, man, after that, there's no way that this can't turn around. Wow, after that, we hit rock bottom and now maybe there's going to be a silver lining at the end of this cloud once we, we get through it a little bit. It doesn't happen to me often, but once in a while, once in a while, maybe I'll get caught up in, in that positivity. J just a little bit. It's rare. But I think that, uh, particularly as I listened to last week's show that we did on the heels of uh, the Orlando terrorist attack, and I spent about a half hour of this program talking strictly to gays and liberals and Democrats and people that I don't ordinarily talk to, and I was advising them to get armed, and, and, and I was setting the differences I have with them aside because I, I want to help them protect their lives, and I want them to live so that we can all debate these issues another day. 
if I'm honest about it, and if I'm a little bit introspective about it, I think that a lot of that segment came from my thinking, particularly on Sunday of last week when the tragedy occurred, my thinking that with, with as horrific and tragic as that event was, and how we all would grieve in the aftermath, and we still are grieving, I thought that the one possible silver lining of all of it was that after that type of event, a terrorist attack on American soil on gays, I thought that after that kind of event, it might finally, at long last, just start the wheels in motion of bringing us all together on the subject of terrorism. I mean, there have been so many times over the last several years that, and we've talked about it on this show and in other places too, but there have been so many times over the last several years that we it's felt like Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton or the Democrats in general. It's not any one person. There's just been this notion, this feeling that they just didn't take Muslim terrorism seriously. Yeah, they knew it existed, but they never they've never really acknowledged it for being the big deal that it is, and certainly have never acknowledged it for being the number one, a number one priority issue that America faces above all else. That message has never come from them. And I suppose that in the back of my head, as we were living and dealing with the horrible images and sounds and stories that came out of Orlando last week. I suppose there was a, a small part of in the back of my mind that thought, you know, when we've had these issues happen to Christians or when we've had them happen to, to regular American citizens, the Democratic Party and Barack Obama has not seemed overly impressed by them. They haven't taken them overly seriously. And maybe in this case, now that it is not a group of average Americans, but instead it's it's one of the Democrats and the liberals' pet groups that were attacked. It's some of their people, by and large, the gays, that maybe that would be the shock to the system they need and it would wake them up to reality much like the rest of us have been woke up to it for, for several years now. At the risk of sounding naive or, or overly optimistic in a long-term sense not not optimistic in terms of the orlando shooting that was an absolute tragedy nothing good about that but in terms of of trying to analyze how people might react to it and how that might affect and impact the way we we all look at the world in the aftermath of it i, I suppose that maybe i allowed myself to get a little bit optimistic Maybe I got a little bit naive. Maybe I let my guard of cynicism drop just a little bit without realizing it. Because in the ensuing week since I last spoke to you, We have gone from simply mourning the tragedy, which we all were on our last program. And now we're back in the political mode, which that's not surprising. But we have not seen any change in terms of liberals in general or the Democratic Party or even the sitting president or the remaining Democratic presidential candidates. And I must tell you, that is shocking to me, and I, maybe it should not be. Maybe, maybe I'm naive for saying I'm shocked by this. I, I don't know. I hate to admit that if it's true, but maybe it's true. After last weekend, I seriously thought that now the Democrats, not from a political perspective, but from a human being perspective, I thought the Democrats, I thought the liberals would now finally have to take Muslim terrorism seriously. To acknowledge it for the threat that it is. Acknowledge it for the danger it is. The danger 
that every single one of us faces every single day in every single city and every single town across America. That's what I thought would happen. But it is not. We were treated to Barack Obama initially having speeches where he would not even say the words radical Islam. Hillary Clinton wouldn't either. She finally, she finally had it pulled out of her. But the entire focus from the two remaining Democratic presidential candidates and the sitting president very quickly shifted to, you guessed it, gun control. Very quickly shifted to a situation where, yet again, the Democrats substitute a fake issue for a very real issue that is the most important issue facing all Americans. Yes, we saw him do it after San Bernardino. Yes, we saw him do it after Chattanooga. Yes, we've seen him do it every single time one of these Muslim terrorist attacks comes down the pike. Yes, yes, yes. I know we've seen it before, but I thought now that some of their people or tragically on the receiving end of it, maybe, maybe reality would slap him in the face and they'd wake up. That didn't happen. And it wasn't simply the reaction among liberal politicians that disgusted me and shocked me. When I went online, and of course you guys know, I, I mention it to you all the time, you can find me on Twitter at RealTravisCook. I'm active on social media. One of the reasons for that is that I truly believe social media gives us one of the best real-time insights into the opinions, the minds, the, 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 the direction of our fellow Americans that we've ever had. To, to me, Facebook and Twitter blow all the polling in the world right out of the water. It's not scientific, it's not perfect, but it's good for getting kind of a general idea what what people are thinking on both sides of the aisle. And, and I think that social media does that better than most old school polling does. So for that reason, I, I tend to be very active on social media. I engage in debates, I engage in discussions, because I want to see where the rest of the country is going. I want to find that out for myself. And yes, I want to influence people, convert people too, but I know that doesn't happen all that often. Really, the main reason I do it is to get that temperature check of the rest of the country. And even to get that temperature check of liberals and see where they're at, what they're thinking, what their direction is. And I have been in some discussions this week with some anti-gun folks that really left me scratching my head. And no, I'm not talking about the usual name calling and stuff like that. Sure, that was out there, but you expect it. But when I could get some of these folks into an actual discussion and talking about actual scenarios... And what do you do if this happens? Wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice to have a gun in this situation? And going through step by step what you would have done if you would have been the one in the, in the club that night. Wouldn't it have been nice to have something with which to defend yourself? The, the responses I got from some of these anti-gunners, I must tell you, they completely shocked me. First of all, whenever the idea would be brought up of, well, if someone had a gun in the, in the bar there, then maybe they would have had a chance. And they would always come back with, well, well you might have shot an innocent person. Well, yeah, but plenty of innocent people were already being shot by this terrorist, so that kind of is a mitigating factor there. Okay. There was one guy in particular that as we went through a long and pronounced discussion about this, it got to a point where I was saying to him, because he was very virulently anti-gun and did not, see, did not see any reason to fight back against terrorists in this way. And I, I asked him, I flat out asked him, if a terrorist were harming your children about to shoot them, wouldn't you want to shoot back? And this liberal told me, no, he would not want to shoot back. Even if his own children were in danger he tells me he would not shoot back at a terrorist now he did say that he would take a bullet for his children of course and I would expect that I would hope he would and I have no doubt he's being sincere but 
but he, well, he would say he would take a bullet for him, but he wouldn't shoot back because he says that it would not be morally right to shoot back at the terrorists. He says you might be able to rationalize it, but that wouldn't make it right. Oh my God. That is really what we're dealing with out there, folks. I mean, I know I've talked to you, to you a lot over the last couple of years about liberals being disconnected from reality and living in kind of a fantasy world, but folks, that floored me. I don't know that I've ever seen more of a illustration of that principle than, than that conversation. And, and again, I have no doubt that this guy was being sincere. He wasn't rattling off talking points to me. He wasn't trolling me. This was a legitimate discussion. And this guy would not even shoot someone who was about to shoot his own children. Evidently, he puts the life of a terrorist on an equal level or, or dare I say, at a greater level of importance than his own children. Folks, I have to tell you, I cannot get my mind around that intellectual concept. I just can't do it. And it gets to a point where we can discuss topics with each other, we can, we can exchange ideas and so forth, and there's value to it, but it gets to a point where the other side is so disconnected from reality that you just gotta you, you just gotta batten down the hatches and destroy them because they've now gotten to a point that they're clear and present danger to all of us our nation was attacked on our own soil yet again by these terrorists that have launched many such attacks over the last several years and our sitting president's reaction was not to blame those who attacked us in an act of war but instead to attack those of us who wish to defend ourselves with a gun of our choosing with a so called assault rifle I hate that term but that's the, the term they're using and I cannot tell you through this week how many times I heard the question, Why do you need an AR-15? Now the answer to that question is that according to the Constitution, it's none of your dadgum business. It's a bill of rights, not a bill of needs. I don't have to justify why I need anything to the government. But, I also understand that there are some people, a very few people within those that group that's, that's harping on that, that may actually not realize the functionality of an AR-15 in a defensive scenario. So for you people, I want you to stay uh, tuned to this show. Because later on, I'm going to go through a detailed discussion of you, with you of why a law-abiding, normal American citizen might choose an AR-15 or other so-called assault rifle for their defensive purposes. But yet we heard Democrats all week talking about how we need to bar civilians from purchasing so-called assault rifles. Again, later in the show, I'll be telling you exactly why an assault rifle can be a good choice for home defense and personal defense. And then they shifted their focus because they knew they weren't getting a lot of traction on that other than the usual anti-gunners. They then shifted their focus to keeping people from a terror on, who are on the terrorist watch list and the no-fly list from buying guns. And they're thinking that's the one area of gun control that we, we Republicans, we conservatives would have to get on board with. And we've had that debate all week. Again, we're attacked in a time of war, and yet we got a sitting president and uh, his prospective replacement talking about whether or not we should change our gun laws. I mean, I swear... If Obama or Hillary or this current Democratic Party were in charge during the time of Pearl Harbor, they wouldn't have declared war in Japan. They'd have tried to change the airplane laws. That's what they would have done. That's where they are. Now, there's no doubt that there is plenty of, of reasons not to get in favor of this type of law where you would bar gun ownership for those on a terror watch list. There's no, no due diligence to that watch list or that no-fly list. There's no, there's no procedure behind it. 
You don't know how you get on it or if you're on it or why you're on it. Mistakes are made all the time. So in that sense, absolutely it's a horrible idea, but I'm, I'm going to go one better. I know you've probably heard those arguments elsewhere throughout the week, as have I. There's no due process behind it. That's true. But there's another argument I could make that seems to be being overlooked. For sake of discussion, let us say that the terror watch list, the no-fly list, let's say they really were buttoned-up lists that were thorough and that the people on there, we knew they were bad people, we knew they were terrorists, they, we knew they were people that we had to be, be uh, critical of, we had to keep it, be wary of, keep an eye on. Let's say that were true. It's not true, but for sake of discussion, let's say that it were. If the terror watch list and the no-fly list actually were constructive documents, buttoned-up documents that really had terrorists on them that we knew were terrorists, then why on earth would we stop at just keeping them from buying guns? If we had such a thorough and good and dependable list, wouldn't we then say, hey, let's take that list and run all these people out of the country or have them killed or do something? I mean, how ludicrous is it to think that you would have a terrorist watch list or a no-fly list that you're sure these people are bad dudes, we got to keep guns out of their hands, but yet you still let them live here? Really? How much sense does that make? Are we to believe that it would be preferable to live in a society where we have a list of terrorists who, just so long as they're not allowed to buy guns, we should all be happy and, and peaceful and okay with them living here. Do you, do you see how ludicrous that is? Do you see how ridiculous that is? Do you see how asinine that is? And that's the argument that not only your sitting president is making, if it was just him, I could understand it, because he's out, he's out the door at the end of the year. But the chick replacing him or trying to replace him is making the same dadgum argument. The socialist monster who thankfully isn't going to win the nomination who's trying to replace Obama, he's making the same argument. That's what we're dealing with. And yet I'm hearing reports this week that there are people in the Republican Party who are focused on somehow denying Donald Trump the nomination. And yet again, I say, come on, get your freaking priorities straight, people. Donald Trump, for whatever problems you've got with him, and I've got a few, but he has been, he has been strong on terrorism. He has been strong on illegal immigration. He's not faltered from that. And we have a political party on the other side who is literally in a time of war trying to disarm the very people, the very citizens who are trying to defend themselves in this country. Folks, that is treasonous action. In a previous generation, Americans would have been hung for less than that. Now, these folks aren't going to be hung. They're just going to run for political office. But instead of calling him out, on that, instead of fighting him on that, we on the Republican side are worried because Donald Trump said something that might accidentally be considered racist. Come on! Get your act together, folks! Let's get our priorities in order. The Democratic Party refuses to fight Muslim terrorism. Period. End of story. More to the point. They want to obstruct you. They want to prevent you. They want to keep you from purchasing the weapons that you want or that you need in order to defend yourself, defend your family, defend your loved ones, and defend this nation from the Muslim terrorists. They're blaming you for protecting yourself. We hear so many times on different topics, liberals talk about blaming the victim. Well, folks, the liberals are blaming the victim here. They're blaming you. They're blaming me. They're blame, blaming every law-abiding gun owner in this country, and there are millions of us. They're blaming us for some guy running into a gay bar and yelling, Allah Akbar, and shooting it up as though we're the problem and not him. 
When was the last time you heard of a Christian running, running into a gay bar with an AR-15 and shouting, Allah, Jesus, while well, he shot it up? You haven't, because it hasn't happened. And it's not going to happen either. I was hopeful that slowly, surely after last week, some sanity would somehow ooze its way back into this political debate. But the Democrats have shown that won't happen. And Hillary Clinton has not differentiated herself from Barack Obama, which is unfathomable to me. I'm not sure how she expects to win a third term for that party without doing it. And the Republicans, at least those in leadership positions and those who are afraid the sky is falling politically, they, they're, they have their... They have their priorities in the wrong place. Stop fighting Trump and start fighting the traitors, folks. Come on. Get it together. The stakes in this election are so high, and not just politically, but literally, it's life and death, folks. The Islamic world has a knife to our throat. And the president's political party, the Democrats, Hillary Clinton, don't seem to care. Doesn't seem to matter to them. The Supreme Court will be changed for a generation because of this election, and you're worried that Donald Trump said something rude. Go screw yourselves, folks. Let's get our priorities straight. Folks, we'll be back with more right after this on Truth Frequency Radio.